Hi, I'm Dave Himmel, Himmel Brothers Leather. We're a bespoke custom jacket maker here in Toronto, Canada. We make leather jackets primarily and some other things. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my Canuck leather jacket. If you like this video, you want to learn about leather jackets and leather jacket making, follow us on Instagram, Himmel Bros, or our YouTube channel, Himmel Bros Leather. So, little shout out wearing my black Himmel Bros pocket tee available on the website. This is free note cloth, 20 ounce Japanese denim, pertolas, and I'm wearing my Vibird Himmel Bros collaboration boots, which, hey, I can show you. Those are five years old. They're fucking awesome. We're working on a new collaboration with Vyberg. Always got something coming down the pipe, so keep an eye out for that. So I'm going to talk about the history and the design of this Canuck leather jacket. Why Canuck? So for those of you who may not be aware, Canuck, Johnny Canuck, is a short form term for a Canadian soldier. It comes out of our multiple participation in world wars where people referred to Canadians as Johnny Canucks. And as I am a Canadian brand, I thought for one of my first four jackets, and this was one of my first four designs, that I would call it the Canuck because there's nothing more iconographic than the expression Canuck for a jacket. It's a simple, strong, masculine name, and this is a simple, strong, masculine jacket. I'm gonna hold the jacket up just so you can see. We call this the Canuck Railroad Jacket. That's the front. That's the back. Okay, we'll discuss the design in, in detail, but I'd like to talk about the history of this jacket. Why is it a railroad jacket or a railman's jacket? So in the 20s and 30s, there was a real history of workers saving up money to purchase a leather jacket because they worked outside in rough jobs. And working the railroads was one of the toughest jobs there was. You were constantly in danger of getting injured or crushed or killed. It was dirty. You were around huge, unbelievably heavyweight machinery. You were fixing steel rail, dealing with coal, dealing with railroad ties, dealing with equipment. And to keep those railroads running, which were the first forms of transportation across North America before roads, you needed to wear something that kept you protected from the snow, from the rain, from hot metal, from uh, rocks from things flying through the air and something you could layer up as an outer shell or garment something that was super strong uh, little known fact because people often talk about the price of jackets um, a worker that wanted a really solid leather jacket might pay 20 to 30 dollars for that jacket that might be almost a month of work for that person they often had layaway plans or ways to put down to buy a leather jacket to save money over time. That's how vital and valued leather jackets were in that period. So you can imagine when people talk about how expensive something is today and it's a $300 or $400 jacket, which isn't even one third of a week's pay, you can imagine why jackets made in these small shops in the 20s 30s and 40s were so well made they were well made because people paid dearly for them and they expected quality and they expected functionality this jacket is a really simple clean design and it was based on a, a very simple single breasted 1930s jacket from a very interesting company called shanhouse and sons william shanhouse who was William Shanhouse? A uh, Russian Jew migrated to America and he was a glove maker and he opened a glove making shop in 
I believe it was Rockford, Illinois. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure it was Rockford, Illinois, making gloves. Everybody who worked needed leather gloves. One of the principal industries for leather goods besides belts for machinery was shoes and gloves. As we all know, a leather glove when you're working would have been an, an essential piece of protective equipment. Now, Mr. Shanhouse bought early sewing machines and once you had a sewing machine, you could make other things besides gloves. And one of the things that he invented was a coverall for automobile mechanics to work on automobiles. He patented that coverall and became quite wealthy being up in the Northeast selling coveralls to the emerging automobile industry. Now, you can't patent clothing like that anymore, but in the early days of garment making in the industrial Northeast, patents were very common. You would often find a leather jacket, like I can think of the Admiral Byrd leather jacket, where there was a little patent tag for a pocket design or patent pending for some other clever design. Now, at some point, obviously, if you patented clothing design, people wouldn't be able to buy clothing. And that idea of patenting clothing design eventually fell away. Rather, you can patent certain things about your brand, but you certainly can't patent, patent making a pant design or a jacket design anymore. Um, Shanhouse grew to be the single biggest manufacturer of garments in the US by the 1940s. So imagine this small immigrant glove maker, and then he expands to leather jackets and coveralls. And by World War II, they were so large from their tiny one-man shop in Illinois that they had taken up all the sewers in Illinois that were available and I believe they moved to North Carolina because there were more people they could keep hiring and opening factories and were licensed to make a huge percentage of the uniforms for US soldiers in World War II. And they renamed the company, I believe it was American Garment Co. Not 100% sure, but I'm pretty sure they were the single biggest garment manufacturer in the U.S. during the war. So this is a, a real story of a, a small family-run business. The sons take over, grow the business, and then by the 1970s, with the advent of offshore manufacture, they disappear from the garment industry. Uh, I've talked to some of the great-grandchildren of William Shanhouse and a couple of them had some small denim brands in the 70s and the 80s but the legacy of a glove maker lived on for almost a hundred years almost a hundred years now in my collection I have a version of this very early jacket and this would have been one of the first designs that came out of Shanhouse and Sons and the design itself was so classic and so modern looking that I felt I had to adapt it to the Himmel Brothers catalog when I first started. Uh, it was just so unique within the realm of leather jackets. So one of the things about work jackets is you would want to be able to do them up easily. They would want to be tight to the body but give you a lot of mobility in your arms because you're working. You would want to be able to layer things underneath them and uh, you wouldn't want to have any loose parts hanging out because those loose parts, if they got caught in equipment, you know, you could get killed. So this jacket has a real classic, simple design. There is a shape to the front panels that comes in at the waist. It's a three quarter length jacket and it has a beautiful triangular upper top and then it's a sort of almost form-fitting girdle that 
would have been worn down over the hips, which is very typical of work jackets at that time because if you were working outdoors, your pants were very high. They used to have like 17 inch rises, very high pants and a short shirt. And the jacket coming very low wouldn't allow for a lot of air to flow up. Uh, but in order to make a jacket work when it's that long and it's wearing across your hips and you're working, you need a really good shaped arm or the jacket would bind up. And shaped arms were not very typical in the 1920s and 30s. But this jacket has a very early example of a shaped arm with a very simple tubular cuff that could be done up and tightened and a very simple collar. It's almost a W collar, but not quite. So it's got the double lapel. So it almost looks like a really cool tunic. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean. You can see there's the very simple straight top chest panel and then a very long, large piece and two really simple slash pockets. So it's a three quarter length work jacket and it has these cool low pockets that are kind of short. They're not deep and that would have been perfect for holding your cigarettes or a small tool but also they give it a really cool look on the front. So extremely simple. And as you can see from the front panel shape, which is really determined from the back of the jacket, and it's got that twisting seam, it sort of tapers in and flares out at the hips. So it has this beautiful sort of tunic suit jacket quality. And if you notice the arms, again, typical and, and atypical of an early 20s, 30s jacket, the Shan House jacket had this beautiful shaped arm so that you could work in the jacket and move, move around and not get bound up in the leather. Now you can imagine the man wearing this would have had a sweater underneath, a shirt, an undershirt, a high-waisted pair of pants, so he needed that large arm shape to both bend it, work, and, and wear his multiple garments underneath. So this one I used a very light colored uh, American waxed button thread. So it really shows the decorative features and the reinforcement of the triangular stitching around the pockets. That would be so if you put something heavy in there or it got caught, it wouldn't tear. It wouldn't tear at the edges of the pocket. And I have original old stock four hole 1930s buttons. So this is a very authentic 30s style. This, this leather is a dark brown uh shinky japanese horse hide okay and we have this very simple collar where you could do up the collar and it has a sort of little wide neck gap and simple points or you could leave it down and have that little double lapel the collar wasn't particularly good for insulating your neck as you can see so the person wearing it would have been wearing a scarf or something underneath for warmth and if we flip the jacket around the canuck has again this simple double stitched, double stop top stitched yoke and a very simple two panel back and then these closing tabs and you see they're corduroy lined on the back which was authentic to the original jacket probably saved you a little bit of money instead of using two pieces of leather that you can use to tighten it at the waist so that it fit a little tighter and those are adjustable so they're an adjustable back tab you can have it looser or tighter depending on where you adjust it and again a very simple arm there's a little bit of an arm gusset in the armpit but it's mostly that arm shape with that slight flare on the cuff you see how primitive that is and it sort of flares out with the adjustable cuff that makes that makes the jacket look so beautiful and so simple and so clean so it's a simple design but it's a very masculine design and it's a very pretty design. I'm just going to give you a quick tour of the liner. This is our Vietnam, Vietnam tiger stripe, authentically replicated twill in Japan. And as you can see, it's a pretty simple jacket, one inside pocket, because again, you wouldn't want too much stuff in your pocket. And it's got that golden penis tiger stripe and a nice little reinforced corduroy 
arm gusset for where you would wear with your armpit when you were working in the jacket that would make the underarm feel a little softer so you wouldn't get any chafing but it would also protect that area so the liner wouldn't wear out so quick and as you can see the liner goes straight to the edge instead of having facing this is very typical of early jackets they would take the liner straight to the edge because they wouldn't really think about relining these jackets the jacket would probably wear out from all the work at the same rate as the liner and it like all our jackets that's a Reese 101 gimp buttonhole so we're talking very clean construction very strong construction very tight stitching you won't see any needle holes in our jackets from the walking foot machine when when we sew the jackets the 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 double stitching is not perfectly even because it's single needle we do it twice it's not a double needle machine and that variance gives a real handmade look to the jacket and we have the slight shape to the bottom hem so it's a beautiful pattern I'm gonna thank William Shanhouse and all his sons for coming up with the original style of jacket and the fact that it still looks so modern and so clean is just a great feature and this is one of our best-selling jackets so I hope you enjoyed learning a little bit about the history of where this Canuck design came from. If you want to follow us on our Instagram, it's Himmel Bros, or on YouTube, Himmel Bros Leather. And uh, look forward to seeing you for the next bunch of videos. Thanks so much. Be safe out there. Don't get the COVID.